All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here is the list of topics to be covered in this video. First up, the function h of x equals x plus 4 to the 7th can be expressed in the form f of g of x, where f of x is x to the 7th and g of x is what we need to find out. Now f of x is x to the 7th, meaning whatever you plug into f is raised to the 7th power. Therefore, f of g of x, since g of x is what's being plugged into f, will be g of x to the 7th. Now we want to end up with x plus 4 to the 7th, so we're going to set those equal to each other and say that x plus 4 to the 7th is g of x to the 7th, which after taking 7th roots immediately gives us that g of x should be equal to x plus 4. Next up, given that f of x is equal to 2x squared minus 4x and g of x is negative 2x minus 3, we're going to have to determine a whole bunch of compositions. First up, what is f of g of x? So what we have to do is take g of x, which is negative 2x minus 3, and plug it into f of x. Now f of x is 2x squared minus 4x, so the input has to be squared, multiplied by 2, then multiplied by 4, and then you take a difference. So here we have 2 times the quantity, negative 2x minus 3 squared, minus 4 times the quantity, negative 2x minus 3. Once you square that parenthetical term, that's what you'll end up with, and I've distributed the negative 4 off on the right-hand side. And after you multiply a whole bunch of stuff and collect like terms, we have 8x squared plus 32x plus 30. Next up, what about g of f of x? So here we're taking f of x, which is 2x squared minus 4x, and we're plugging it into g. So we need to multiply by negative 2 and then subtract 3. So we distribute out that minus 2 and subtract 3, and there we have it. What's worth pointing out is that f of g of x is 8x squared plus 32x plus 30, whereas g of f of x is negative 4x squared plus 8x minus 3, and those are not the same thing. The order of composition in general will matter. What about f of f of x? So here we're taking f of x, 2x squared minus 4x, and plugging it into f, which is 2x squared minus 4x, so we need to take that input, square it, multiply by 2, and, multi and subtract 4 times it. And we have to expand out that squaring, distribute the negative 4 on the right-hand term, multiply that parenthetical term by 2, and collect like terms. And here we have 8x to the 4th minus 32x cubed plus 24x squared plus 16x. Finally, what about g of g of x? Well, g of x being negative 2x minus 3, that's what we're going to have to plug in to itself negative 2 times the quantity negative 2x minus 3 minus 3, which after you multiply by minus 2 and collect like terms, we just have 4x plus 3. Problem 3, let's let f of x be x over x minus 3 and g of x be 3 over x. First, compute the composition f of g of x. So we're going to take g of x, which is 3 over x, and plug it into f. So we have 3 over x over 3 over x minus 3. Up at the top, note that f of x is x over x minus 3. Whatever you plug in, you put in the numerator, and then you subtract 3 and put that down in the denominator. But here we're not plugging in x anymore, we're plugging in 3 over x, hence this expression right here. If we multiply numerator and denominator by x, we can simplify our expression. However, this is only a legitimate thing to do when x is not 0. And we end up with 3 over 3 minus x. Having distributed that x in the numerator, we cancel it out, and distributing the x in the denominator, 3 minus 3x. I want to stress that the domain of f of g of x does not include x equals 0, because 0 cannot be plugged into g. And if you didn't account for that little bit here in the third line, you might end up with a final result of 3 over 3 minus x, which would appear to have 0 in the domain, but 0 is specifically removed from the domain of this function because it cannot be plugged into g to begin with. What about g of f of x? Now we just have to do this in the opposite order. Since f of x is x over x minus 3, we have g of that, which is 3 over that. Provided x is not equal to 3, we can simply do the division by reciprocating and multiplying, and we end up with 3x minus 9 over x. And as in the previous problem, if you didn't account for this forbidden value of x, you might end up with a slightly different result. However, since 3 is not in the domain of f to begin with, it cannot be in the domain of g of f. Problem 4. If f of x is x to the 4th plus 2, g of x is x minus 1, and h of x is root x, what about this triple composition, f of g of h of x? Well, all we have to do is go through one step at a time. h of x is root x, so that's what we're plugging into g. Now, g of x is x minus 1, so g of root x is just root x minus 1, and now this is going to be plugged into f, so we simply have root x minus 1 to the 4th plus 2.
In problem 5, we have a table of values and we're asked to evaluate some given expressions. First, what is f of g of 8? Now g of 8 is 0 because 8 is being plugged into the function g. But now we have f of that, so we ask what do we get when we plug 0 into f? And the result is 2. So f of g of 8 is equal to 2. Next, what about g of f of 2? So the first thing we do is plug 2 into f and get out 6. Then we're going to take that 6 and plug it into g and get out 6 again. So g of f of 2 is equal to 6. What about f of f of 0? If I plug 0 into f of x, I get out 2. And now I plug that into f of x and get out 6. So f of f of 0 is 6. And g of g of 3. The first step is to plug 3 into the function g, getting out 5. Next up would be to plug 5 into the function g and get out 9. So g of g of 3 is 9. In problem 6, we're given two graphs, one for this piecewise defined monstrosity f of x, and over on the right, a pretty reasonable straight line for g of x. We're going to be asked to evaluate various compositions, like f of g of minus 1, g of f of minus 2, f of f of 2, g of g of minus 4. Well, let's just start with item a, f of g of minus 1. The first thing is to plug minus 1 into g, and based on the graph of g of x, it appears that g of minus 1 is equal to 2. Now over on the left, we're going to take that value of g and plug it into f, and it appears f of 2 is 1. So f of g of minus 1 is 1. Next, g of f of minus 2. So the first thing is to plug minus 2 into f, and it appears we have an output of minus 1. Now we're going to take that and plug it into g, and as we remarked in part a, g of minus 1 is 2. So g of f of minus 2 would appear to be 2. For f of f of 2, first thing is to take 2 and plug it into f, and it looks like we get out 1, and now I take that output of 1 and plug it into f again, and it looks like we get out minus 3. f of f of 2 is minus 3. g of g of minus 4, the first thing we're going to do is take minus 4 and plug it into g, looks like we get out 5. Then we plug 5 into g, and it looks like we get out minus 4. So g of g of minus 4 would appear to be minus 4 again. For problem 7, consider f of x equals minus 5x minus 6, and g of x equals root x minus 5. First, what's f of g of x? Well, g of x is root x minus 5, so we're going to plug that into f of x. So we have negative 5 times the square root of x minus 5, all minus 6. What's the domain of this function? Well, look at the expression we have. The only restriction is that when we take a square root, we cannot take the square root of a negative. So what is under the radical must be non-negative. So x minus 5 has to be bigger than or equal to 0. In other words, x must be bigger than or equal to 5. What about the composition g of f of x? Well, f of x being minus 5x minus 6, we plug that into g. g of x was the square root of x minus 5. So g of the expression negative 5x minus 6 is the square root of negative 5x minus 6 minus 5, otherwise known as negative 5x minus 11. And what's its domain? Similarly, the only restriction is that what is under the radical must be non-negative. So negative 5x minus 11 should be bigger than or equal to 0. By adding 11 to both sides, negative 5x is bigger than or equal to 11. Division by negative 5 will flip the inequality because we divided by a negative. So x is less than or equal to negative 11 over 5. Just remember, when you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, it must reverse the direction of the inequality. In problem 8, we have the functions h of x is 1 over root x, and f of x is x squared minus 4. We're going to be asked to compute the domains of three different functions. First, h of x over f of x. Second, h of f of x. And third, f of h of x. So let's look at item A. We have the quotient h of x over f of x. Now, in order for x to be in the domain, both h of x and f of x on their own must exist. Let's first take a look at h of x, 1 over root x. Since there's a radical, x must be non-negative, but we're dividing by it, so it also cannot be 0. Those two things combined tell us that x must be positive. f of x has to exist in order for us to take the quotient h over f, but f of x is a polynomial, the domain is all real numbers, but since it appears in the denominator of this quotient h over f, f itself cannot be 0 f of x was x squared minus 4, saying that it cannot be 0 is to say that x cannot be plus or minus 2. 
So altogether, x has to be positive for h of x to exist. x cannot be plus or minus 2 in order for f of x to be non-zero. Now, x being minus 2 was already taken care of by the restriction that x had to be positive, but x not equaling 2 splits the domain into these two intervals. Everything from 0 to 2, not inclusive, and then everything larger than 2. For b, we have the domain of the composition. The first thing that happens to x is it is plugged into f. So in order for x to be in the domain of the composition, it must be in the domain of f. However, f was a polynomial, its domain is all real numbers, so so far, no problem. But then f of x itself has to be in the domain of h because it's going to be plugged into h. As discussed in part a, the domain of h of x is positive numbers. Therefore, f of x must be positive. So x squared minus four must be larger than zero. x squared must be larger than four. If I take the square root of both sides, we get the absolute value of x must be larger than two. It's extremely common to make the error that the square root of x squared is x. It is not, it's the absolute value of x. This also accounts for possible negative values of x and is correct, making it better than making a mistake. So the absolute value of x must be larger than two. In other words, the interval from minus infinity to minus two, but also the interval from two to infinity. Part C, what's the domain of f of h of x? The first thing that happens to x is it's plugged into h, and we've already remarked that the domain of h is positive values of x. Then whatever h of x is, it has to be in the domain of f in order for the composition to exist, but we've remarked a few times now, f is a polynomial, its domain is all real numbers. So it doesn't matter what h of x is equal to, it will be in the domain of f. So altogether, x has to be positive, and then nothing else really matters. And here we have it. Now there's a common mistake that one could make while computing the composition f of h of x. If you plug h of x into f, you get one over root x squared minus four, which is one over x minus four. And it looks here like any x that isn't zero is fine. If you have one over x minus four, there doesn't appear to be any reason you couldn't plug in, for example, negative 10 or something. But you can only square h of x when h of x exists, which is why we do these problems in these steps rather than computing the composition and sort of simplifying as much as we can and then asking what the domain is. We do this step-by-step -step approach. You have to be in the domain of the inner function, then that output must be in the domain of the next function, and so on. Problem nine. We have the function d of p, which is going to give the number of items demanded if the price is p. So capital D, stands for number of items demanded, and little p is a price. The production cost c of x is the cost of producing x items. So capital C is a cost, and little x is a number of items. The question asks, to determine the cost of production when the price is $6, which of the following is appropriate? Solve c of d of p equals 6, evaluate c of d of 6, evaluate d of c of 6, or solve d of c of x is equal to 6. Now the price is $6, that's what's stated in the problem. The price is little p, so we're going to set little p equal to 6. Now looking at item A, this would say the cost of a certain quantity of items is equal to 6. However, price is 6, not cost. Overall, this says cost of something equals 6, that does not match our given information that $6 is a price, so A is out. Similarly, D would say that the quantity of items demanded for a certain cost is equal to six, that capital D, a quantity of items equals six, but again, six was a price, not a quantity of items, so D is out. What then happens with our variable P? It gets plugged into the function capital D. In this third item, C, this would plug a price into our cost function, but looking up at the statement of the problem, the production cost C of X is the cost of producing X items. What is supposed to be plugged into the cost function is a quantity of items, not a price. A price is supposed to be plugged into the demand function D. So item C is out. And in option B, the price of $6 is plugged into demand as it should be. Demand then outputs a quantity of items, which is exactly what is supposed to be plugged into the production cost capital C. Problem 10. Suppose we have the functions given below and we're gonna be asked to simplify a few expressions. Now a, which is h of x, is seven plus two x. x itself is capital B of t, which is seven plus seven t. So what is h of b of minus one? Well, the first thing to do is plug minus one into b. This evaluates to zero. And now we plug zero into h and this becomes seven. Next, 
set g of t equal to h of b of t and simplify. So b of t is 7 plus 7t, 7 so that's what's going to be plugged into capital H. h of x was 7 plus 2x, so now we have 7 plus 2 times the quantity 7 plus 7t, 7 which simplifies down to 14t plus 21. Third, set g of t equal to h of negative 3 plus 3 times capital B of minus 1. Now h of negative 3 will simplify down to 1, and b of minus 1, we've actually already computed in item A, it's equal to 0. So we simply have 1 plus 3 times 0, which is 1. Observe that this is now constant, doesn't really depend on the variable t as we were instructed to use for capital G on the left. That's fine, g of t just happens to be a constant function. Next, set g of t equal to h of t minus 2 plus 3 times b of t. Well, h of t minus 2 is 7 plus 2 times the quantity t minus 2, which once you distribute and simplify is 2t plus 3. b of t was 7 plus 7t, 7 so now we have h of t minus 2, which we've already computed to be 2t plus 3. We're going to add to it 3 times b of t, and once you distribute and simplify, 23t plus 24. Problem 11, if f of x is x plus 3 and g of x is x minus 3, then what's the composition f of g of x? Well, we take g of x, which is x minus 3, and plug it into f. f of x says take your input and add 3, so we cancel the plus and minus 3, and we just get out x. What about the composition g of f of x? Very similarly, we take f of x, which is x plus 3, plug it into g of x, which says take your input and subtract 3. The 3s cancel, and we just get x. So we have two functions, f and g, where f of g of x is x, and g of f of x is also just the identity function x. So g of x is called an inverse function of f of x. This is the definition of two functions being inverses of one another, that the composition in either order produces identity. The identity function being a function of x simply equals x. So whatever you plug in, you get out the identical thing, the identity function. So we found f of g of x is equal to x and g of f of x is equal to x. Therefore, they are inverse functions of one another. Problem 12. Are these functions inverses or not? Well, at first glance, we have multiplication by 4 and subtraction of 4. And on the right, we have division by 4 and addition of 4. So maybe it seems somewhat plausible. But let's actually compute the composition. f of g of x is f of x over 4 plus 4. What does f of x do? It says take the input and multiply by 4, then subtract 4. So we have 4 times the quantity x over 4 plus 4 minus 4, which once you distribute the 4 and do a little simplification, you get x plus 12. If they were going to be inverse functions, both orders of composition would be the identity function x. We've computed one order of composition and didn't get the identity function x. We got x plus 12. So no, they're not inverses. In problem 13, we're going to use the provided table to compute various values. Well, what's f of 5? So let's sort of scan the table until we look for a 5 in the domain. There it is, and we see that f of 5 is equal to 9. If f of x is equal to 6, then what was x? So now, 6 should be in the range column for f of x, and here we find it. What's the corresponding x? x equals 2. Next, what is f inverse of 9 equal to? This is asking, what is the input that would create an output of 9? That is what the notation f inverse of 9 equals blank means. What would you put in to get out 9? So again, we're going to scan the range column until we find a 9, and that corresponds to x equals 5. Finally, if f inverse of x equals 2, then what is x? This is confusing to say out in words, but it's essentially saying 2 is the input that gives an output of x, and that means the output was 6. f inverse of x equals 2 is simply asking the input is 2 and the output is x. So we find an input of 2 in this chart, and it gives an output of 6. Problem 14, we have three tables that could represent functions, possibly. We're asked which ones are functions, and if they are functions, are they one-to-one? -one? Now, to be a function, any x value from the domain can correspond to, at most, one y value in the range. It doesn't have to correspond to any, okay? The domain of a function doesn't have to include every number, but any number that is in the domain can correspond to only one value. 
Here we see that x equals 8 corresponds to two different y values, 7 and 13. So this table is not even a function. In both of the other tables, however, there are only three x values to check, and each one of them corresponds to a single y value. 2 corresponds to 1, 8 to 7, 14 to 7, and in the bottom, 2 to 1, 8 to 7, and 14 to 13. So each x has one y associated to it. They are both functions. Now, to be a one-to-one -one function, we sort of do the same thing in reverse, and we say that each y value can only be associated to one x value. In this middle table, we have y equals 7 corresponding to two different x values. So this is a function. Each x corresponds to a single y, but it is not one-to-one -one because there is a single y, specifically 7, that corresponds to two x's. In the bottom chart, however, the three y values are all unique, associated to unique x values, so this is one-to-one. -one. In problem 15, we let f of x be 10x plus 4, and we're asked to compute f inverse of x. So f of x, we're going to set equal to y. y is 10x plus 4. Now an inverse function swaps the role of input versus output, or domain and range. So what we're going to do is switch x and y. Here is our inverse function. Compared to f of x, it exactly reverses the role of what is plugged in and what is gotten out. So now we have x equals 10y plus 4, and if possible, we would like to solve this for y. Well, all we have to do is subtract 4 from both sides and divide by 10, and we get y is equal to x minus 4 over 10. So there's our inverse function, x minus 4 over 10. You could check this by computing the compositions f of f inverse and f inverse of x, and in both cases you'll end up with the identity function x. There is another approach you could do, which is really only feasible when there is a single x in the expression for f of x. So I wouldn't recommend this as your primary approach, but it might help you understand what's being done. In the expression for f of x, ask what happens to the input x and in what order? So the first thing that happens to x, it is multiplied by 10, and then that thing is added to 4. Now what you do is undo those operations, but in the opposite order. So operation 2 was adding 4. So let's subtract 4. So starting with x, take x minus 4. Operation 1 was multiplication by 10, and we can undo that by dividing by 10. So in the previous line, we had x minus 4, and now we divide that by 10. In problem 16, f of x is x plus 5 squared. Here's a graph of that function, a nice upward opening parabola with vertex negative 5, 0. First, what's the largest domain on which f is one-to-one -one and non-decreasing? Now, by inspection of the graph, if you look over on the right, this green bit is non-decreasing, it's always going up, and it's one-to-one, -one, there are no heights that are repeated. However, if I tried to extend any further to the left, then the parabola would start coming back up again, duplicating heights that had already been achieved and including bits on which the function is decreasing. So the domain from negative five to infinity is the largest domain on which f is one-to-one -one and non-decreasing. It's an upward opening parabola. In general, this is how you would find the largest domain on which a parabola is one-to-one. -one. You'll go from the vertex and then in one direction, depending on which side you want. Now, restricted to this domain, f does pass the horizontal line test. In other words, it is one-to-one -one because it is increasing. So here's a horizontal line. Observe that it intersects the original parabola twice, but having restricted the domain to only include the right side of the vertex, the green graph, it only intersects that once. And I can move all the way down to the vertex or all the way up, and all of these horizontal lines intersect the green graph to the right of the vertex of the original parabola, intersect it only once. So the largest domain on which f is one-to-one -one and non-decreasing is from negative five, including that, to infinity. Next, give the range of f. So just by looking at the graph, we have a vertex at negative five, zero, and it's an upward opening parabola, so the range includes everything bigger than or equal to zero. Also, you could think x plus five is being squared, so that is non-negative, it is bigger than or equal to zero. Third, find the inverse of f restricted to the domain we found in part a. So we swap the role of x and y, and we're going to try to solve for y. x is equal to y plus 5 squared. To solve for y, on the left we have plus or minus root x. Now, however, it looks like y is associated to two different x's, and it shouldn't be. So we need to know, are we taking plus root x or minus root x? We're going to take plus root x, but it's not just because we want to. There's a very good reason. Our original restricted domain was that x must be bigger than or equal to minus 5. 
we've swapped the role of x and y in this expression, so in this expression, y has to be bigger than or equal to minus 5. In other words, y plus 5 is bigger than or equal to 0. That's exactly on the right-hand side of that equality. So the right-hand side, y plus 5, is bigger than or equal to 0, which means we're definitely not going to take the negative square root. The left-hand side can't be negative, while the right-hand side can't. So we take positive root x equals y plus 5, and now we can solve for y, subtracting 5 from both sides, and we found our inverse function. What's the domain of this inverse function? We could attack it directly. We have y is equal to root x minus 5. However, the domain of the inverse is always going to be the range of the original function on the restricted domain. And in part b, we found that the range of the original function was y bigger than or equal to 0. So that's our domain for our inverse function. Similarly, the range of the inverse function is the restricted domain that you inverted on, minus 5 to infinity. Problem 17, let f of x be 1 over x plus 15. Let's find the inverse function. So the first method would be, what happens to the only x that ever appears in the expression? First, 15 gets added to it, and then it gets reciprocated. So we start with just an x, and we start to undo these in reverse order. The opposite of reciprocation is reciprocation again. So having started with x, we now have 1 over x. And the opposite of adding 15 is subtracting 15. So 1 over x minus 15. So f inverse of x is 1 over x minus 15. The other way you could do this, and this will work more often than the technique on the left, is you simply let y equal f of x. And then you swap the role of x and y. So now we have x equals 1 over y plus 15. And you solve for y if possible. So reciprocating both sides, 1 over x equals y plus 15. Subtract 15 from both sides, and you get exactly the same expression, 1 over x minus 15. Problem 18, let's find the inverse function of f of x equals 11 plus the cube root of x. Okay, so rather than do both techniques to find inverse functions, I'm just going to do the switch x and y technique. It works more often. So let y equal 11 plus x to the 1 3rd power. I'm switching to a rational exponent rather than a cube root. That's just a personal preference of mine. And otherwise, I'm now going to swap x and y. So x should be 11 plus y to the 1 3rd. And now we need to solve for y. I can subtract 11 from both sides and then cube both sides to cancel out that exponent of 1 3rd. And we get y is equal to x minus 11 cubed. There's our inverse function. Let's find the inverse function of 7 plus the square root of 2x minus 9. So we have y equals 7 plus the square root of 2x minus 9. We swap all of our x's for y's and vice versa. And now we need to solve for y. So we can subtract the 7 over to the left hand side square both sides to get rid of that radical. Now we can add 9 and divide by 2. So y should be x minus 7 squared plus 9 all divided by 2. There's our inverse function. We could simplify that numerator. We could foil it out and whatnot, but there's no particular reason to. I, I say we're done. For problem 20, let's find the inverse function of f of x equals x plus 2 over x minus 10. So we write y equals x plus 2 over x minus 10. Then we replace all of our y's with x's and all of our x's with y's. So x equals y plus 2 over y minus 10. And the goal now is solve for y, meaning I should have y all by itself equals, and then on the other side, no more y's appear. So if I multiply both sides by y plus 10, I can cancel out that denominator on the right. Then I'm going to distribute that x times y minus 10 to get xy minus 10x. I'm going to get every term that has a y on one side and every term that doesn't have a y on the other. So I'm going to subtract y from both sides and add 10x to both sides to get xy minus y on the left and 10x plus 2 on the right. Now I can factor a y out of that expression on the left and divide by x minus 1 to solve for y equals 10x plus 2 over x minus 1. Problem 21, find the inverse function of f of x equals 6x to the 7th plus 7. So y is 6x to the 7th plus 7. We swap our x's for y's and vice versa, and now we need to solve for y. So I subtract 7 from both sides, divide by 6, take the 7th root, and there we have it. y is x minus 7 over 6 to the 1 over 7 power. There's our inverse function. Problem 22, police use the formula v equals the square root of 20 times l to estimate the speed v of a car measured in miles per hour based on the length l of its skid mark measured in feet when suddenly braking on a dry asphalt road. At the scene of an accident, a police officer measures a car skid to be 236 feet long. Approximately how fast was the car traveling? Answer, 
rounded to the nearest tenth of a unit. So 236 feet long was the skid mark length, that's L. So all we have to do is find V, so we simply plug L to be 236. The square root of 200 times 236 is the square root of 4720. Using a calculator, this is about 68.7 miles per hour. Problem 23, the formula V equals the square root of 2.5 times R, models the maximum safe speed, V, measured in miles per hour, that a car can travel on a curved road whose radius of curvature, little r, is measured in feet. A highway crew measures the radius of curvature at a particular exit ramp and says it's 4,320 feet. So what is the maximum safe speed you can drive going around this turn? For this problem, round your answer down to the nearest whole number, and then we're going to want to consider why that's appropriate. So the radius little r is 4,320. All we have to do is plug that into the expression that the maximum safe speed is v, which is root 2.5 times r. So we're going to take 2.5 times 4,320. We get 10,800. We take a square root of that. With a calculator, this works out to be about 103.92. We were instructed to round down to 103. Now why is that the good method for this problem? Anything larger than 103.92 is considered unsafe. We were solving for the maximum safe speed. Anything larger, not safe. So rounding down is appropriate. In fact, in the real world, at least here in the United States, the speeds given are always multiples of 5. So this would probably be rounded down to 100. And with very, very, very rare exceptions, the speed limit on the highway is going to be less than that anyway, so they probably would not bother putting up a sign.